no matter which sort of law it comes from that shows what ideology can and cannot tolerate. It is the magician's imperative to test the limits of the thinkable. If the artist's imperative to test the limits of the sale, the, the magical artist lives in the edges of totalitarian tolerances because aesthetics are and always have been the edges of our expressive possibilities. Art has always served to stretch the sale. Art and magic share the powers of creation. More importantly, they share the power of manifestation. The most skilled magicians, the most creative creators, the greatest artists, the best manifestations will attempt to account for the reality that things are not always as they seem. All radical work is a challenge to the normal. This is why resistance is eternal. There will always be a center that excludes the margins. Our mandate is to break the boundaries between included and excluded to puncture and draw those boundaries outward so they can include new ideas, new ways of thinking, new ways of seeing, and new ways of being. We are not attempting to establish a new system of control. We are calling for a new vision of freedom, one that is more thoughtful, reflective, reflexive, and authentic than what we currently have, a total rethinking that completely disregards existing boundaries between people and ideas. We int intend to pull coerci a coercive rationality up from the roots. More sex, more fun, less repression, less compliance, liberation over servitude. This is a culture of harm that, there is a culture of harm that sickens our earth. Harm is causing others to suffer. Suffering is undue stress caused by circumstances beyond one's control. We all desire and deserve the right to live our lives unimpeded by anything, but none of us have the right to create a warrant of harm and suffering in others. This leads to a crucial distinction, as creative manifestations, radical thought, magical practice, and other forms of unbridled creativity have no problem with causing distress. Distress is the precursor to change, yet only impoverished manifestations distress other, others simply to aggrandize the self. This is bad magic. The richest manifestations get others to willfully, willingly give of themselves. Exploitation is a negative force when it serves to subjugate other people, but it is also possible to see exploitation as a productive force, something that gives license for taking advantage of the world around us however we see fit. Some situations and people not only deserve, but beg to be taken advantage of. We have no problem with taking that which other people don't seem to want. People whose ignorance, apathy, or inaction support mindless ideological regimes will be the first casualties of our war. The best way to start this war is not with externally directed physical violence. The best way to start this war is to interrogate from within, to question ourselves before questioning others so that we may have a better stance for understanding productive exploitation, directed magic, and other creative manifestations that enact the world we want to see, not the world we are told to see. With that, I talk about my family. And I'm um, glad my brother's here in the audience. Um, I'm the middle one of three brothers. Um, Jacob, Abraham, my eldest brother, and myself. Um, we're all very creative people. Um, I'm honored to, to say that I have a lot of love for my brothers and we're all very close and support each other in, in a lot of our work, um, being musicians, writers, and performers and artists. Um, come from a family of, of uh, a mixed family. My mother, um, she's uh, originally from Sonora, Mexico, Desde Batuc, uh, a small little Yaqui village that doesn't exist anymore. And um, the connection with my mother's family is uh, the Teran family, is why I adopted the name Cooper Teran and started using that as a, out of respect to my mother and that lineage and also as a way of uh, connecting to my roots, being Yaqui and Mexican. Um, my mom's story is very interesting as well. The village that she came from, it doesn't exist anymore because uh, there was a whole story around a dam that was built that ended up flooding her village along with two others that was part of um, the Yaqui River Valley, uh, kind of near um, three hours east of Hermosillo. And uh, I'm gonna show a brief video kind of Summarizing that. Yo soy originario de Batu, Sonora, y fue un pueblo fundado en 1629 por los frailes jesuitas. Mis antepasados todos, todos han sido de Batu. Mi abuelo, mi bisabuelo, mis tatarabuelos, todos, todos fuimos, fuimos originarios de Batu. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
pero nosotros nos vimos forzados a salir del pueblo porque el gobierno iba a construir una presa, la presa del Lobiño. La presa se construyó en 1964. Desde entonces nosotros salimos de Batú en 1959. El agua empezó a subir como en, eh, empezó a abrir las compuertas de la presa, como en eh, el 60, yo creo. El 60, porque nosotros eh, nos mudamos a Hermosillo. Y, eh, y en Hermosillo, nosotros oíamos en eh, noticias de Batú que la que el agua ya estaba corriendo más, iba subiendo así de poco a poquito, tal vez 10 metros arriba, si sí, no, no sé qué tanto, qué tantos centímetros de, pero estaba constantemente subiendo. Mi padre, Anujo Terán, hombre de pueblo, pero de ideas liberales, inteligente y diferente de la gente común del pueblo, antigobierno y antirreligión, trabajador incansable y de ideas genuinas. Yo como padre por dentro, muchas cosas, y padre mi padre grande me decía, mira cómo va a ser, va a haber cosas, lo que ya tenemos más grande, que van a pasar muchas cosas de Fuera de mi silla, Muchas cosas me pasaron, que le cuenten por la historia que me pasaron, ¿no? que me pasaron, no, nada pobre, muchas cosas muy increíbles. Tía Rosa, libre como el viento, sin ataduras, simple y genuina, le gustaba la vida del pueblo, fumar y hablar de las noticias más novedosas. Mayan Rosa was from the old times, and Mayan Rosa was from that kind of people that they were afraid of the city. She had to move in two different places in the town. They said that my aunt and she went and lived in the house of my parents. And then from there, because the water was rising, My aunt, she moved to different houses that they were empty by that time. They lived, let me think, like about seven or eight, eight more years there. Some people used to say that my aunt was living in the church one time. She lived there until my aunt got that very, very sick. So she had to go live in one hospital there in the city. She was forced to go and live in the city. Like longer, but I was more like 
they get sad, you know. They get sad just before they die to get out of that one place that they live all their lives. And that was from one day to the other, they come the water that came from Mexico City. And nobody, nobody that was out of the water from Mexico City, nobody knew the town, that they did not even knew the town. They never were, they were there. The government only, only they said, oh, we need it down here in that part, that, that would be a nice place. So we had to, we had to destroy this, these three towns, Batu, Tepupa, and Suaki. So in, um, my mom ended up growing up mostly in Hermosillo uh, with her family. And through uh, some interesting circumstances, uh, visiting family in New Mexico, she ended up meeting my dad, uh, who's a Russian Jew from South Philly, as he always liked to describe himself. Uh, he moved west, uh, got romantically uh, uh, connected to the west, and oddly, reading Carlos Castaneda and discovering that, those books, which I don't, like that guy. <laughs> but uh, he ended up moving west, met my mom. Um, they didn't know each other's languages uh, through two years of courtship. They ended up um, learning enough to be able to connect, got married, and settled in, in Tucson because it's the nearest town. They didn't want to live at Nogales, but they chose Tucson because it was just the closer, bigger city to Hermosillo, which is where most of my family was is based. Um, we we're, we grew up here in Tucson. My parents settled here, and that was probably in like 1980, early 80s. And uh, in 84, um, mom had a Brom, and uh, then had me in 85. And when I was nine months old in 1986, uh, our family kind of came into a strange set of circumstances um, where my dad was uh, wrongfully arrested. Um, for being Tucson's primetime rapist. Through a strange set of circumstances um, involving a misidentification through fingerprinting um, and through um, evidence that was found at various sites where the suspect had been committing over like 30 acts of rape between the two, uh, between 1984 and 1986. Um, a lot of pressure was brought on by the community to uh, arrest the suspect, and through misidentification, my father became a suspect. Um, they arrested him, this footage was broadcast the night of his arrest. Um, so his name and his identity was put out um, pretty immediately, and it led to us, um, uh, well, for him, they, they kept him, and for like 17 hours and uh, interrogated him. And ultimately after that amount of time, they discovered or realized that he wasn't the person after doing further DNA testing on him. Um, all of this subject without a lawyer present and denying him his right to a lawyer as well. Um, but it was definitely fueled by a witch hunt that was very present in Tucson at the time um, that was brought on by uh, a lot, of, a lot of different communities around town were, were afflicted and pressure was put on the Sheriff's Department and the Tucson Police Department. And so their task force ended up um, uh, trying to find suspects. And they had a very interesting way of wanting to find a suspect, interrogate them, and try to get a confession out of them, very much like a witch hunt. Um, so uh, we were kicked out of our home. Dad lost his, his jobs, he ended up getting PTSD, diabetes, and other health problems that kind of afflicted him for the rest of his life. Um, it ended in a civil suit, ultimately, um, between uh, my dad and the uh, City of Tucson Police Department and the Sheriff's Department. Um, what, what financial gain came out of it was enough to just invest in the house, which is where we grew up, and dad continued to have Growing up with a father with PTSD and chronic pain and illness um, led to a lot of complications late into his life. Um, he ended up becoming addicted to painkillers through the uh, VA hospital system and ended up um, ultimately getting cancer and he ended up dying in 2013 after um, a lot of years of, of 
uh, fighting his addiction, and then during the last year of his life, he actually wanted to kick it, his habit, but that was when um, his cancer was hidden. He was very stubborn too. He never wanted to go and get tested, to get the test done and find out if he had something, but he always complained about pains in his stomach, and ultimately when he got off and was clean, um, was sort of like when the cancer emerged, and uh, he went in at the beginning of January 2013, and after three weeks, he, he had died. Um, and it was his death that kind of spurred on a lot of uh, things within me. At the time, I mean, I was 26, 27, um, I'm 33 now, but um, as a 27-year-old, uh, being a, an artist as well and um, being a creative person, um, it affected a lot of how I wanted to express myself, how I wanted to deal with the grief. I didn't really have a lot of tools or structure in place or uh, expertise or wisdom um, in dealing with his death. A lot of rage and anger emerged from that. Um, a lot of blame and pointing fingers, blaming the justice system, blaming like the people that arrested him, uh, the medical system. Um, and I blame myself too for not really knowing more about the complications surrounding this very complicated person um, who uh, growing up with was very volatile and someone to be feared, but then at the end of his life and as an adult, I found a lot of friendship with my father and a lot of positive outcomes came out of these conversations we would have towards the end of his life. So I, I chose, um, as of my interest at the time, I mean, I would say that art saved me in processing his death and, and the grief of, of his passing. And a lot of that was like tapping into a lot of years of experience trying to work in collaborative spaces with other artists. And, and art was a cure and art is a healer. And because art is also magic, um, and my focus and interest in the occult and ritual and ceremony there was a lot of room to explore these kind of other realms with spirit and with regard to his, his spirit in processing his death. And a lot of work uh, was in, inspired by that. There were a lot of uh, performances and actions and, and physical ephemera that I was collecting and creating art around um, him and what, who he was and trying to understand what that all meant. Um, and there's still like more work to be done. Me and my brother keep talking about like this project that we're still doing about dad and and how it, it's meant to like address a lot of injustices. But then it, and then for me, it's also trying to address a lot of um, issues with with my dad being a problematic person, like growing up with someone who instilled a lot of toxic masculinity too, and who was an abuser in his own right. Um, that's all work that's developing still. But being able to tap into this knowledge or this kind of space of using art as sort of the medium uh, to heal, um, it comes from a long history of being a teenager, being growing up in Tucson, stumbling into different spaces. Me and my brother would like wander around downtown as like a teenager, and as teenagers and just find, stumble into a gallery and just like look at spaces that were very creative and we were attracted to just happenings that would occur. That was kind of how we met Flang Chen. Um, that's how we discovered the All Souls procession. We sort of stumbled into it. We had no idea that this thing existed. Being involved with the All Souls procession led to working with the Ancestors Project, obviously. Uh, my work around uh, the Ancestors Project has been its own space to heal, especially around Dad's passing. And, and it, it, it comes, me and Abram often talk a lot about um, what it means to like tap into this sort of creative space, this energy that, that is very much like, it's like pure, like when we were young, we always like harken back and talk about when we were younger and that there's a, this creative energy that is untapped that is sort of like primal and raw and how to use that, shape that into like any of the body of work that we're doing now. And 
being being involved with such public spaces, like with the procession and with the Ancestors Project, it's 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 been interesting to just see how it's like the technical expertise and uh, skills that I've been developing through all of these kinds of events have led to like seeing kind of like the raw emotion and the real human connection of how people engage the event, and especially when they like honor their dead. And the way that I've honored my father through the event itself, and how that became like a holding space for for healing. Um, and it doesn't have to be in that spectacle either. But being able to to share that and put it in a public space, I think the vulnerability as an artist and a creative person to put out that kind of work and and to be that vulnerable in front of people um, get, makes a lot of room for transformation and healing, especially if 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 it's coming at that time or around dad's death, it's like coming from a place of anger and like wanting to like fuck some system up, but don't really know what it is, but to reflect on just his, his spirit and his life and showing that publicly, I think it's important. Um, but yeah, my interest in, in these other kinds of spaces that I've been exploring, um, mostly since like 2008, 2007, um, really like hit home and, and like seeking something specific or systems of knowledge that are more esoteric and kind of mystical or not really like catering to a specific religious ideology. And we grew up very irreligious in our household. Um, we didn't really go to church. My, my mom and my dad both had their own views about their respective faiths. And um, so they were very, very much like just open. We didn't really practice anything. But there was a lot of room for spirit and a lot of spirituality that both my parents expressed and felt. But for myself, growing up, I uh, didn't really know how to express those things or what, what that information was I was tapping into until I came upon, I moved out of Tucson, lived in the Bay Area, I started uh, exploring, um, I came upon a torrent file. Do you, if anybody knows what torrents are, or pirating or Pirate Bay or any of that stuff, uh, there's a torrent that exists. It might still be out there, but it's called the Occult Carrot. And it was like some guy like, that I met in the Bay Area. He was just like, check out the Occult Carrot. And so I like, looked it up. And it was this, this uh, file that just had like, hundreds of texts compiled from all of these different esoteric people, occultists, and and people that were dabbling in mysticism and writing like radical texts and uh, presenting alternative views of like what reality is. And some of that went into spaces of exploring like sensory deprivation or, or the idea of psychonauting, um, which is this concept of like exploring your inner landscapes. And, and then at that time too, I was getting more into like other kinds of music and, and exploring uh, trance-inducing music. Uh, ex and extreme music too, like things that um, brain synchronization sounds and entrainment and getting into drone music heavily and noise music and music that would create or affect uh, no a sense of gnosis, which is like this concept of um, going into these altered states either through hyperactive or, or sensory deprivation kind of exercises. Um, and then within all of that stuff too, I was discovering this uh, concept of like the alchemy of the body and how the body is as a canvas can be used within a medium to create your art and how the body is sort of like a, its own battleground as well with exploring and, and, and getting into like the tensions and complications of, of identity or of, of your own history or but with that, there was like a very physical element to that, and the elemental nature of that was this notion of like capturing and, and, and scanning fluids. And it was very much inspired by some of the other uh, work that I, I'll reference later. But um, so like uh, spitting on glass with mucus and then scanning that, like seeing what that would look like at a really high resolution, um, getting, extracting blood from myself and mixing other types of mediums with that. Um, keeping a record of these two, kind of in, in different like kind of Gnostic states or states of, of um, sensory deprivation or hyper, hyper um, um, in spaces where it's just like the, the feelings are putting you into these other states. 
um, capturing that in some way. And it, it was like through the fluids and through the scanning of that, those then became like uh, elemental mediums or samples or ingredients that would then be used for like other work. And being a digital artist as well, it was sort of like, again, utilizing this technology in a way, in this magical way, and looking at a scanner as sort of like its own portal to like these other spaces and, and the idea of like that the little, the macro, the micro can become the macro and that these, these things that are of the body are like their own dimensions and galaxies and portals into other landscapes that given the context or the space or the intention of the time that they're being captured, have all of this energy in them. Um, and so it became a process of continuously kind of like destroying my ego and then trying to rebuild it up again and then trying to find other ways to do it through capturing the fluids and capturing um, the essence of my being and, and being able to record that in a way but then with that too is like the notion of, of using um, and being very inspired by like the work of this artist, Austin Osmond Spare. Um, it was like a, a, a draftsman and a magician from like uh, the late 1800s, early 1900s London. Uh, he developed this concept called sigil magic, which is this idea of like writing out um, in phrases of intention or words of power and then synthesizing them into a symbol. And that symbol becomes like a magical um, device that could be used. The idea is you want to destroy that or forget about the symbol or forget about like what the words mean and that's supposed to imbue you with the power of what you're writing. And so being an artist and, and someone who was really grew up drawing too, there was this idea that this profound uh, uh, space of influence of, of using artistic practices but in this very, um, psychonautic way, in this very psychic way, and using them in a, in a, in a way where they're hidden, they're, they're, they're spaces where um, the symbols are all there, but nobody else needs to know what they are, what they mean, but that they became kind of a practice that I've been using, I use it all in my work now, even with any of the visual work I do, any of the video work I do, even in, shooting Columbus, there were spaces where sigil magic was explored in some way, shape, or form. And and that and then speaking to that too is like where how that kind of inspired or influenced working with other people in the in that context and being able to be in community spaces with other collectives and other artists and and how those the my information that I was getting was informing information working with others. Like Ben Wabala is a, is a good example. Um, but Obala is like a binational uh, performance group that, that started in 2007 between myself and Logan Phillips. He was a DJ Dirty Verbs. If you went to the Congress last night, he was the DJ that DJs at El Tambo, one of them. But um, he started as a spoken word uh, poet and toured all over the country, met me. We started doing this thing, this concept called spoken video. And it was this notion of kind of combining videos, poetry, um, live music and performance to to create work that at the time it was a lot of his own writings and, and body of work was concerning the borderlands um being being someone who grew up on the borderlands or on the border um who is uh male identified and white but then got very immersed in in mexico and spanish and uh got involved with a lot of the politics regarding the u.s and mexico he wrote a lot, and a lot of those pieces became sort of the basis for a lot of the work we were doing. And we collaborated with artists in Mexico City, and in Flagstaff, and the Bay Area, and Canada, and this collective was very much um, about site specificity, and also utilizing media in, in a variety of ways that in and of itself was kind of, for literally and figuratively, we're like crossing borders were breaking down about ideas around like just what people might perceive as performance art or what they might perceive as a video or what they might perceive as sound art and and bringing them all together in a very kind of intentional way uh, especially in a way that that addresses uh, the political nature of where we're from the other work 
that I've done too has, has led me to meeting folks like um, David Sherman and uh, he's part of a, a venue space here in town called Exploded View Micro Cinema and um, we developed a project with a collective of other artists, Coach Simon, photographer and media artist, and Heather Gray, um, called Psychmap. And it was about um, challenging and using um, psychogeography in a way with media to create uh, interventions and political actions. Um, that work uh, led to a variety of different like interventions that we did in Tucson, which I'll show in a moment. Um, then the work with Denise Iwahara was also, uh, she was one of the um, co-creators of the Shooting Columbus Project. Um, working with her over many years, since like 2007, um, led to projects involving um, video and, and performance art, live painting, addressing issues regarding migrants and um, undocumented people, undocumented voices. Um, working with Pan Left as well. Pan Left Media is, is a really cool organization based um, out of the Global Justice Center, which is like a really awesome community space. It's like all of the, um, I like to joke that it's like all of the rabble rousers of Tucson are kind of like all based in this one building. So you have like the Hechos Humanos, uh, you have, um, uh, see, uh, what is the other one? Um, the Indigenous Alliance used to be there. You have Pan Left. Um, you have like a number of different groups of people together working in resistance to the powers that be. And meeting Denise and working with her led to other projects like Shooting Columbus as well. And those are those are all um, just reiterating too, like projects that were site specific that had a lot to do with the the nature of where we're from. Looking at um, the resistance of these stories with the people that are telling them and who was telling them by us going out and, and finding those voices or connecting to those voices and sharing in those voices and those stories um, all led to uh, creating work that was very much in the spirit of resistance and highlighting what the resistance is in a in a very tactful way or what I would I would I, I'm always trying to stress it's like what's the sincerest way that we're doing this and not trying to like impose a template over any of these stories. Um, and then other work too is involved, like my, my involvement with the Church of Cayo, which I'll talk more about that later, but that, that's kind of like the more extreme stuff. But as far as um, creating uh, work that is in resistance, it is the notion of what the public spectacle aspect of that is and how, how do you make things um, that can be resistance in private um, exposed and out and the notion of spectacle going big and going hard it's kind of like this idea that we implemented with Psychmap um, when uh, on January 20th uh, 26, 2016 yeah 20, 2017 I'm sorry uh, on that day we we had a, a, an action where we just uh, the, the studio that Exploded View is at um, it's right across the street from the city court building, or the county court building, and we just got a projector and like boldly just projected a bunch of text and just text on the building um, made an impression. It was very bold and, and simple. There wasn't anything really like, um, there were other elements to it, but uh, yeah, we had like um, a bunch of projectors set up in this space, projecting a number of different things and also playing a, a lot of different sounds addressing the state of things for the day, for that day, and for what has been since then. And the idea um, with Sitemap specifically, it, it's, it, it was very much this project born out of bringing together all of these different um, artists that are, coming, that are coming out of media, but then also um, weaving together um, spaces where ephemeral, technologically mediated uh, actions could occur. So they're pop-ups, they only happen like one time or on a very specific day, and they're not meant to be, um, the archive is just the documentation. That's, that's how it exists. That's how we know that it happened. And 
uh, some of the other uh, work that was projected that night too is also the going into like my animated work and the idea of like sampling and what sample culture is all about for me and um, my work as a digital artist goes into this space of constantly uh, referencing photos and finding photos online and creating like massive montages that um, end up being animated in time and the idea of, of being able to animate the cabal, this cabal of like evil, who I consider like evil, horrendous people, um, became like one of the images that was projected uh, on the building that night. And then it's been used for other types of uh, live public space performances and stuff. But um, the notion of, of, of using media, sampling it, copying stuff, and even like stealing stuff, like, because I'm a pirate too. Uh, I, I taught myself how to use all this technology. Um, I was very much into, I'm very much into DIY. Um, I didn't go to school for any of this. Uh, I'm a college dropout. <laughs> and the only way that I knew how to learn anything was when I got into computers, when I got into building my own computers, when I got into, um, uh, the internet and what piracy was, it was so easy, especially like going with the Vebo Walla project. Everybody I knew in Mexico City only pirated. That was sort of like the way that you got anything because it was either too expensive or uh, it was just too much of a hassle to try to uh, legitimately pay for a license like for Adobe. So a lot of the first years of like teaching myself any of this media or any of this skill set. Um, solely came from pirated stuff, black software. And, and uh, now it's a little bit different um, with the spaces that I've been working in. There's, there's definitely more, um, like I have a license that I pay for now, or that Benny Mousman's stomach pays for. Um, and it's, it's kind of an interesting thing, like shifting from that to like being like more legit. But, but it's a strange space too, because it was always like growing up, you have like, these layers of kind of limit, uh, boundaries of like, well, you have to go to school to learn this stuff, or you have to buy, you have to spend like hundreds of dollars for this software. And it's like, well, how hard is it to get the software? Why, why is it so expensive? Why, there were all these questions as a teenager I was asking, and then it was like, oh, there's a way you can like crack something, or you can download this thing that a hacker made and unlock the program, and now the program's yours, and I didn't have to pay for it, I just had to download it. And, I felt like that consistently influenced a lot of the way that I work too. Like I don't put a, I know there's an inherent copyright in anything that I do, but I never claim copyright. I don't like care if people steal my shit and like want to reproduce it. I take I take honor in that. I think that is flattering whenever those situations have ever happened. Because um, I don't claim ownership with this work either, because it is so heavily sampled and referential to other things around me. Um, it's more like my skill set and the spirit of how I work is what defines me. And the work itself is sort of, it's like a byproduct almost of, of the intention behind creating any of it. Um, there's just some footage from another intervention that I did with PsychMap. On um, December 19th, 2015, there was a, a, world, a national day of protest or a worldwide uh, day of protest that was organized by Adbusters called it D19. And uh, that day also happened to fall on uh, the holiday parade that happens every year in Tucson. The holiday parade is, is like a very quaint, nice, like Christmas parade that goes down one of the main drags of, of Tucson, downtown Tucson, down Stone, and ends at the park near Armory Park where um, the procession of little angels will be tonight. Um, we wanted to intervene the space by building a card that we could project to projectors onto any of the buildings we were going through and put a sound system on. Um, I was playing a bunch of uh, yaki like drumming beats and um, noise music by uh, sampling from uh, Raven Chacon from Post Commodity, uh, who's another native indigenous performer out of New Mexico, an amazing installation artist and musician in his own right. But um, it was this idea of mashing these sounds together, 
jumping into the parade, you have to like get a permit to be in the parade, but we just kind of like got in to a point where we just jumped in and then we just started going in and everyone thought we were in the parade as like another flow. Um, and so some of the projections were, some of those images of the text that you saw earlier, um, there were photos of uh, some of the original homes that were in that block, which is called Barrio Viejo. It's like one of the oldest barrios in downtown Tucson. Barrio Stories, we'll probably talk about that tomorrow for the other panel that I'm going to be in tomorrow. Um, but um, that barrio was uh, leveled pretty much to build the Tucson Convention Center and, and um, how homes of, of all these Mexican American uh, communities and families uh, were, pretty, were pretty much just ousted because, uh, yeah, the city of Tucson wanted to build the, the convention center and they basically uh, stopped uh, cleaning the streets and, and basically made it so that none of the trash companies would pick up in the streets, so uh, uh, trash collected and then they they basically condemned the neighborhood and then like that was the excuse to level it. Um, so showing photos of like what was in that space before, sort of like this other uh, impression of what psychogeography is, like the idea of yeah, multiple layers or multiple histories kind of like going on at once. Because um, the past isn't just like before, like I always like to believe like time kind of uh, is always happening, like the past is always happening on top of the present, on top of the future. and. The spaces that we get into to express that, I feel like technology is sort of the, the middle ground or the mediator for that to allow um, an impression or uh, a window to open to perceive time in different ways and to recontextualize buildings or spaces that people are physically walking through on, on the regular. Um, we were also um, kind of like not into the Christmas spirit. Um, so we were showing a lot of like footage of Chinese factories like making mass producing toys and showed stuff from uh, some pagan festivals like the, um, the Krampus festivals that they have in Europe and showing uh, uh, a lot of other pagan imagery. Um, ended up at the, at the Masonic Temple um, where we ended up setting up and basically just projected on, on that building for the rest of the night. But what was interesting is that our, our sound did like get on people's nerves. There were families that came up and told us to like turn it down. And, um, and then some folks were, were um, really offended by the pagan imagery that we were showing, the more uh, Christian-minded uh, folk. Um, so it was an interesting engagement. This was kind of like the most uh, direct in your face that like the psych map collective project was about and, and jumping into a public space and just sort of taking it over um, using video and media and sound without without trying to be didactic um, but then ultimately um, uh, that work sort of informed kind of the public spectacle and nature of what body of stories is and what what has become uh, the body of stories project um, who's going to the fiesta tonight Cool. Yeah, it's sweet. That was, so the garden that you're going to, um, it's, uh, it's a community garden that would, that is kind of like maintained by the elementary school that's across the street from it. Um, that became such a magical space for the for the event that we had in that neighborhood. Barrio Anita, that neighborhood, is very different from Barrio Viejo. Um, Barrio Anita is a still it's a it's an historic neighborhood. It's on the registry of like historic spaces or places in the country just because of the, the architecture it dates back to over 100 years and you have a lineage of history of, of many many families um, who first settled in tucson or mexican-american families who were here before tucson even became tucson um, coming in and and living in this neighborhood um, so it's protected in, in a sense it's it's never going to be gentrified it's never going to be torn down but um, there, there's, there's, a, there's sort of like a, a, sad, a lot of sad history with the neighborhood too because during the 70s and 80s there was a lot of gangs in the neighborhood. A lot of territory between different gangs was, was established. It was dangerous to be in the neighborhood. A lot of kids that were growing up in the 50s and 60s 
some of them got into gangs, some of them got into drugs. Um, one of the one of the beautiful takeaways though from that project was just the whole like notion of the resistance to the gang culture and drugs and violence and how uh, the resiliency of the neighborhood comes through. Um, and it was a lot of it was represented with the Ouri Center, which is a community center next to the elementary school. Ouri Center became kind of like the safe space for all of these kids to go to since like the 40s is when it was built, maybe even in the 30s it was built. They had a lot of sports programs through there. There was a lot of counselors and coaches that ended up mentoring a lot of the kids. And, and some of the videos or interviews that we did uh, that you might see tonight like addresses that, like just how important Ouri Center is and still is to today with, with regard to having a space for young people to go to. Um, but the name of the place, the Auri Center, it's, all, it's also really funny too, because Barrio Anita Project, what we did with Barrio Stories, uh, we got caught up kind of in the history of Auri Center. What does Auri refer to? Auri Center is named after William Auri, who was uh, one of the first mayors of Tucson, and also his claim to fame is being responsible for the the uh, massacre of, of Aravaipa Apaches that happened at Camp Grant back in the, eight, the late 1800s. This guy basically rallied a bunch of uh, Mexicans and, and, and other natives, uh, Tonawakam as well, and some Yaquis together, and they ended up uh, uh, raiding this, this uh, camp that was um, not too far from Camp Grant. Um, so there was this like notion of uh, how to address that um, and, and push back too because so many of the residents and people that live there in Barrio Nita, they're, they're very much, um, they love the name, they didn't, that, that's how they grew up, like knowing that name and for them to like learn this history or even if they did know the history, the name still like meant a lot to them. But to present the history in this kind of flip way was sort of uh, really important to just show like the other side of it. Um, so there was there was an animation or a video that we did make that that was made in collaboration with um, some of the residents of the neighborhood, like these two younger kids, um, who we had some sessions. They kind of like scripted it or or, or did the uh, the storyboarding of it, and through like our collective efforts, we put together this animation. County Clark. First president of the Arizona Pioneers Historical Society and ringleader of the Camp Grand Massacre. But Bill already had an interesting life even before he got to Tucson. He was born in Virginia in August 13, 1817. At 16, he came to Texas looking for adventure. He was at the Alamo in 1836, but was sent on an errand just before the famous battle started, so he missed it. At 23, Billy was still looking for a good fight. He joined the Texas Rangers. In the Texas Rangers, he got to shoot Comanches in his main job. One of those times was at the Battle of Plum Creek. The Battle of Plum Creek actually started March 8, 1840 in San Antonio. Comanche chiefs and their wives had come to make a peace treaty, but the Texas soldiers killed most of them. That summer, there was one chief still alive, Chief Buffalo Hawk. He led a, a raid in revenge against the Texas Cole killed all his friends. Buffalo Hump and his men stole a lot of horses and killed some of the white people and their slaves along the way. On August 11th, Ori and the rest of the Texas Rangers found Buffalo Hump at the Plum Creek. They killed 80 Comanche warriors, but Buffalo Hump got away. 
There are people in the neighborhood who do want to change the name of the Outreach Center. There are others who don't, but it's just a conversation stuff. <laughs> Obviously, with the work with uh, Borderlands led to, uh, and working with Denise and Rachel, um, led to working on the Shrink Columbus Project, which you, most of you have seen uh, last night, and uh, working with T and, and Ryan, and addressing, again, indigenous resistance through, through the media, through the storytelling, through these interviews that we, that we gathered over many years. The project itself took five years in the making, Three of those years, we're just figuring out our process and figuring out how to represent any of these voices. And, and thankfully, because Ryan is such a beautiful, amazing performer and very passionate about his story, his representation in the piece and how he functions within that became a very critical um, <coughs> figure and, and, and metaphor for what, what type of story we were trying to tell with that. Um, yeah, the process of working with different communities like the Yaki uh, community, addressing their water issues, going to Tan Watham um, uh, Reservation, uh, meeting another performer uh, who worked on the actual show, Matthew, um, who's an amazing uh, uh, he's a performer too. He was getting into theater studies. He was a student of Rachel's uh, in ASU. Grew up, uh, grew up on the res, but uh, this is in the Tone Alta Nation, out, out by Cells. Grew up out there, but ended up moving to Casa Grande and was going to school at ASU. All over the place, but yeah, he was uh, a very amazing contact, going with him to the border, and literally, like, he literally walked me to the border. Like, this is us, we're driving into the, we're already in the res, but he, like, pulls off on a dirt road, and. It's a little farther up, it's a, it's a fence. But I know that probably, like, like again, Border Patrol probably have it, like, blocked or protected it more due to, like, the vanishment, you know, in and out. But even, even then, you know, it's still constantly watched over. Um, like I said, there's people living on the other side, but, you know, to, some are not referred to as, as citizens. Right. But you know they're still they're still all the people. You know, they're still part of a people. And you know we used to cover all this land farther down south of Mexico, all the way up to the Phoenix, Tucson. But when the government came, that's when they ran the borderline straight through a reservation, and they were trying to tell us to come on this side if we want to be recognized as U.S. citizens. But we said no. We said we're going to stay right where we are, and because of that. We now have people on the U.S. and Mexico. You know, it's just because of that. You know, we don't. We're not abandoning them. We're not disowning them. Right? And they're still our people, and that's one of the good things about it: is staying united. I mean, staying where we are and having the borderline come through us. I mean, that didn't stop us. Didn't stop us. It's not going to find where our land ends. All that out is a part of our land. We share with the Mexicans, you know, other indigenous tribes and other people who are different from other ethnicities, cultures. This is all their land too. It's not just ours, but it's everyone's. But now it's just supposed to be divided and saying, this is us and that's them. No, it wasn't. It always, it will always be our land. And again, not just us all of them, but other indigenous. through the reservation, they're not allowed to build a wall or anything that, and there's this, all this conflict going on right now with the Tonawatham tribe and the U.S. government and our, pres our current president <laughs> wanting to build a wall that goes right through it, and they're like, just come and try it. Like, you're not gonna build on this. This is like, a, this is a, it's a nation. It's their own, like, isolated or separate nation. But what's sad is that the border this arbitrary line cuts right through their their ancestral land, and it, it's bizarre. Like the Tonawatham uh, tribe itself is like the second largest tribe in in Arizona, and um, and as far as like space, 
an area like they take up, they're second to the Navajo. And, and they're often not really looked at or talked about as much, but it's huge, huge. Like this component with the Shooting Columbus Project was, was very much like what kind of rooted it to, to doing it here and, and being able to acknowledge and recognize those voices too. Um, I'm just gonna kind of speed through some parts because that's me flipping off Peabody coal mine. Um, uh, this is me during a, a, a sound resistance protesting uh, at the San Francisco Peaks in Flagstaff. Doing a Shooting Columbus project kind of radicalized me with a lot of these anarchists, uh, indigenous native groups based out of Flagstaff and out of Phoenix. But um, yeah, we participated, Ryan and I, in a, in a protest. I wanted to come with the sound, so I just like, did sound more basically, um, and had a mic so that people could be protesting or making their voices heard louder. Um, the San Francisco Peaks is one of the holy peaks of the, of the Diné tribe. Uh, it's one of four holy peaks or holy mountains that kind of establishes what, what's Beneta, is like the Navajo uh, nation. Um, and the San Francisco Peaks, are, they have, they're right outside of Flagstaff, but they're, they're, they have a ski resort up there that they, uh, well, because of climate change and changing weather and everything, it doesn't snow like it used to up there. So a company actually uh, blasts the mountain with fake snow that's from recycled sewage. And it's basically like shitting on their temple <laughs> or their church. It's kind of like how they equate that. Um, so yeah, getting radicalized into the work that we were doing um, with Shooting Columbus led to kind of engaging really fully uh, these different spaces of resistance um, and, and connecting in a way that I felt was like my way to bring it. Like I can't, re I'm, I'm coming from Southern Arizona, going up to Flagstaff to protest. That's, it's like, the, what is my position in that, in that space? What am I supposed to be doing? Um, what is the respect and care and, and the agreements that our group is making? Like, who wants to get arrested? Who's okay to get arrested? What are we doing if the cops show up? Uh, what is your role in all this? And I took it to be like, I wanna be in a space of support, but then also be a surveillance. So I had cameras all over me, like a GoPro connected in my head and holding two different phones and have the sound device, and that was like kind of my way or my tactic. That was sort of like I'm going to bring what I know how to do, the skill set of what I know how to do. Um, the work with Logan Phillips and Ben Wala again that led to doing a project called Sonoran Strange. It's kind of like looking at the whole kind of complicated history of the borderlands and the Sonoran Desert. We ended up uh, building this structure um, that was like a huge orb that we projected both onto on both sides of and we perform inside of it, outside of it, and around it. Um, all of the synthesis of like sort of the ceremony, ritual, uh, magic, using um, video and sound, live, mixing, all of that, all those elements, um, was sort of uh, using this vessel or this structure as kind of like um, an engine uh, for, for transforming a space and how people engage that, depending on the spaces that we presented in, um, became very, um, uh, poignant, insight specific. Um, so we perform this all uh, around the Southwest to taking it to Ajo, Albuquerque, um, San Francisco, uh, Douglas, uh, Phoenix, uh, Bisbee, Tucson, and, um, and, and so this became sort of for many years from like 2012 to 2015 or so, 16 I would say was the last time we performed it. Um, it, 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 the mobility and the versatility of using, of using all of these kinds of uh, materials uh, and tech to be able to, to move something and make it pop up anywhere, I think was, was kind of like the strongest point or power of, of that particular project. And to contextualize like what, what is this area that we call the Sonoran Desert and what does it mean when we're addressing any of these issues and histories through this installation piece. Um, there was another project that involved, uh, how many of you have like went up Tumamak Hill or know about Tumamak? It's like not the A mountain, it's the one, it's the taller one next to it. It's, uh, it's a, it, you could hike up it after 5 p.m. every day, um, 5 till 7 in the morning I think is, it's open to the public. Um, 
During the day, though, it's a science center, it's a laboratory that's based up there, a desert laboratory that was built in the early 1900s. Logan and I did a project built around that. I don't know if I have enough time to go into it, too, because there's a lot of things that we were addressing with that that kind of is a longer story. But um, there was an artist, though, that was like making all these placards, uh, uh, kind of informing people about like the hill and the animals that are on the hill, and then I got into like remixing that stuff, too. Uh, yeah. Um, let's see. That that thing with Tumamak though, it did involve uh, like taking over the hill, kind of. Um, we were wanting to do a project up there. The Desert Laboratory and the U of A didn't really want us, or they never acknowledged a, an application that we submitted for an arts initiative that they had to invite artists to work up there or do projects up there. So it was like a year and a half process of like not communicating or getting any feedback from them, and then we finally just said, screw it, we're just gonna like set up a gurney and a battery and go up the hill and project onto the hill. Uh, again, projecting uh, sigils, and then there was a, a poet piece that we did, basically asking like, because uh, we were addressing really the history of the Desert Lab and what the Desert Lab represents. It's a historic big deal lab for botany and for southwestern botanical uh, sciences for desert plants and it kind of like started the whole science of desert uh, studying botany in, in, in the southwest established by Carnegie, Andrew Carnegie and what was funny about him is that if you have, look up the Latin name for saguaro it's actually um, it's named after him like Carnegieum whatever it's like something one of the in the Latin word Carnegie is in that and it's because he funded and started the Desert Lab. Um, and so it made all these breakthroughs in the science of botany. And our thing was like, well, who gets to, like, why is this science being acknowledged and honored, but then there's all of this other history of thousands of years of history of all this other knowledge and indigenous knowledge that has existed. And, and it's, it, it was a very complicated process and project to get involved in, but was kind of like our way of sort of staging um, a creative space to do that and, and address some of these questions that we were asking. Um, I don't know how much time I have. It's like, how much time do I have? Eight minutes. Eight minutes. Uh, yeah, I could get into like the heavier stuff I've been involved in with uh, working with uh, Stephen Johnson Leva and the Church of Kyoto. Uh, any of you that are staying through tomorrow, um, check out the MOCA. I'm being, I have a show there right now. I'm in a group show, and what I, this last part of the of the presentation was what I was kind of wanting to cover was the work that I do with Stephen Johnson Leva. He's a Mescalero Apache, also a priest from the Church of Satan, um, who I met in San Francisco in 2010. We developed a lot of work around uh, the food war, specifically Monsanto. Did a whole series of performances around GMOs. We made like death curse altars that we allowed the public to participate in and leave their curses in with. Um, an iteration of that is in the MOCA Museum if you want to go there. It's open through Sunday. Um, and there's an installation of a lot of the work that we were doing and media that we were building around that time, including like an altar that you could put your curses in if you want. Um, yeah, so to, to, to bring it all back to what this is, it's sort of like um, how, how does my art or how does anybody's art address resistance and, and how does, uh, one of the things that I often got like conflicted with is like working with a lot of activist communities and activist groups, and it was always hard to find people that were like, using art in an activist kind of way, and in a radical kind of way, or trying to challenge like the notions of how to present yourself in different spaces uh, if you are in resistance to something. And I, we're all in resistance to something. I feel like uh, to acknowledge one's own history and look at your roots and kind of like go deep within, that's sort of the basis of the foundation for resistance. Once you start realizing how you fit into this world and into these communities that we're all inhabiting. And then if you're an artist and working through art, I think there's this opportunity to really get into um, 
using using your talents and using your skill sets, but in collaboration too with other people to be able to create uh, really meaningful uh, statements or really me address meaningful stories or address topics that I don't think it are easy to explain like in a very didactic way. Or it's like if I'm just standing up here and telling you a story, like the the sensual somatic experience of experiencing somebody else's art and somebody else's vulnerability in a creative way, I think that leads to so much more healing and so much more transformation. Um, yeah, so I mean with that, there's there's so many questions that I end up keep asking like with regard to any of this work. Like again, it's like some of the A's that you're mentioning are the same A's that I was mentioning. It's like who's the audience, but who's also the target if you have art war that you're wanting to wage. Uh, and I think in that it's it's it might seem like aggressive, but I also feel like it's a necessary skill and a tool to use as an artist and to to not uh, deny that it's good to have the fury and the rage and the fire to spark things and to start fires and to be like in a space where you could be like, no, fuck that. Like, I don't agree with this. I don't agree with that. And this is how I'm going to express it. And it could be as angrily and as sloppy as possible, but the craft of the art and the artist is like learning from that and sharing those tools and sharing those skills and experiences. And I think that's what will build maybe a better world or transform things better or address the things that that just talking about them won't do. So I'm sorry, like I wish I, I wanted to cut out some time to like open up for questions. So any questions that you have, I mean, with, with how much time do we have? <laughs> Four minutes. Four minutes. <laughs> okay. And it was about the Civilian Conservation Corps. Yeah. It was celebrating these white guys damning things up. And it was so disappointing to me. So I love that idea of, of culture jamming plaques in public spaces. Super culture cool. jamming, yeah. That's, yeah. The, that's the best show yeah. for that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there was a plan to do it for like, all the placards. Um, but then uh, it became Logan got a little. I'm always like pushing too, because then it becomes this thing like, oh, we should put our logo on that, then they'll chase it back to us. And like, yeah, whatever. Sure. You know. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. Uh, so I was walking over by the convention center, and there, there is a city, it appears to be an official city plaque recognizing the, the neighborhood that was there. I was like, oh, it was the first thing I saw when I got here yesterday. I was like, yeah. kind of surprised. There's a, there's a statue if you go down Cushing towards the freeway too. It's like of a woman and her child like pointing at the convention center. That was made by one of the residents, Luis Mena from Barrio Anita. Um, also addressing and acknowledging that. But that's like, yeah, it's an interesting, like, nice afterthought. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> yes? It's a mural preserved on the side of the building. Um, calling for the end of the Vietnam War in 1973. And it's painted around it, but the, the old paint is there. Someone's decided to save that. Huh. And Where I wonder, I, who knows, I was wandering this damn city this morning. Um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll probably be able to show you at some point. Yeah. But I'm wondering what the effect on your community is of this. Are you seeing anything? Is this kind of uh, assault work? we would call it guerrilla in our day, um, is it having an effect? Are you seeing more of it done by other people? Are people changing the conversation? I feel like, um, you know, I can't really speak to the guerrilla work. That I, there, there used to be a, a bigger like scene back in like 20 years ago, like in Tucson. Um, I think because the changing landscape, Tucson's going through a lot of gentrification right now. Um, there have been more conversations with other like-minded people in my communities uh, who do want to get back into wheat pasting. But we were like, uh, you know, my partner was just talking to me about this the other night. He's like, we should be wheat pasting this alley here, like, and, you know, bringing to light whatever we want to wheat paste. But um, I can't say that, like, that type of guerrilla art is really present either. Like, I feel like it died in some ways, or like it, it, it went underground a little bit. And, and, and 
sort of like, there was a, I mean, there was a huge graffiti scene here back in the 90s. Um, a lot of great graffiti. And some of the murals that you see around downtown, they were painted by some of these graffiti artists that were like doing it really guerrilla and, and, and hidden. Um, but then there was a huge movement on graffiti abatement that happened like in the late 90s, early 2000s. So they were like hitting really hard on anyone who was caught graffiti or, I mean, laws just got stronger. But then you have like, there's an indigenous hip hop group called uh, Neoglyphics that's based out of uh, New Pasqua and, and I think Cells as well. Um, but they, they do these pop-up events in, the, in some of the barrios, uh, like Barrio Centro has usually like these events where they'll put up um, huge panels like this and it's just like people are graffitiing on them for the day. Um, what happens to those, Ryan? You know, because you go to those. The yeah, like whenever all the graffiti artists are like done with the panels. Um, I'm pretty sure they save them. Yeah. Just let them Paint over them. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's definitely, I mean, this, you know, I think the graffiti scene here is definitely is a little bit rising mm -hmm. from the underground. Um, you know, for such things, you know, they have the hip hop festival, which is every year, and that takes place uh, right at one nine one tool. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think everything is still kind of underground right now, as far as the graffiti scene and the yeah. mural scene. Yeah, yeah that's definitely something I felt with. I feel with Tucson, like there's these waves of kind of communal uh, action that. And, and like, that's not to disregard like any of the current political activism that's going on here that Tucson is super rigid, um, but relating it back to like the artistic practices and, and artistic communities and collectives that, that work in that space. Yeah, it's like, I've seen it like rise and fall in all the years that I've lived here. And even when I went away and came back, like so much happened in just like one year, but yeah. to this, but I really appreciate hearing your personal story and how that, that drove you into, into some of these aesthetics. And I, I'm curious if you could just say more about your own experience with taking intergenerational trauma and communal trauma and combining it with resistance and how you see that as a healing practice. It's, uh, uh, to me, healing and confrontation, they're, they're difficult things to hold next to each other, but I see you doing that in your own. I mean, There's this notion of like, just trying to be fearless around getting that deep. And then I think, and it's because, I mean, thankfully we had parents that were totally supportive of our creative endeavors. That I think that's something that I'm, I'm very privileged to, to talk to, to speak to, that there was a lot of support for anything creative that we were doing growing up. Um, so it just seemed like this logical step in, in taking, um, that kind of trauma and the trauma of, of growing up and, and trying to address my dad's trauma because it was like, in all these conversations I would have with him, it's like, well, my dad did this to me and his, my grandpa did this to him and it's just like this, this, this like cascade of, of, of problems that, that the arrest and what he went through kind of like just augmented all of that. Like it unlocked all this stuff. Um, having those conversations with, with my dad, I think at the end of his life or as an adult, like when I was 16, 17 is when I kind of really started talking with him. And he was a very like open person. He kind of like wore his like emotions on his sleeve. So there was always like space to talk about things. But um, I think it, as I got older, I kind of wanted to get deeper at like how he was treated or I had more of a mind because I think I was also very curious and wanting to document so much of my own life growing up that there was like a wealth of, of information there and feeling like, okay, I, I need to bridge the gap between not just the trauma and the anger, um, but doing that through the work. And, at the time, I didn't know that that was the healing process either. It's sort of like stumbling through that through intuition was what did it for me, but 
but also like just trusting my my artistic practices or my creativity as as a space to, to feel anything. And I think it's a weird combination of things too, because it's like, yeah, like what if my dad didn't want to talk about any of his pain or any of his trauma, or didn't want to talk about how he was abused as a child or how his grandfather was abused, or like, and, and him acknowledging that he abused us too, in like the ways that he would apologize to me, like very candidly about how he treated me as, as a guy with PTSD and very volatile behavior. And, um, so it's hard to, to like to find that connection where it's like it, it suddenly clicked because it's like I feel like my whole life was programmed or set up or built and encoded with like a process that I kind of only only through this presentation or in the last year that it's like been clicking like oh yeah art heals like this way of going into my history and and. And, and then through the Shooting Columbus project too, learning more about like what interge intergenerational trauma is, relying more on that idea that like art can heal, um, art can be the, the, the uh, arbiter of, of trying to find space to let go of that trauma or to, to, to process that trauma. But it's not, it, I don't think there's like a blueprint that I could still like figure out. Like if you got X, Y, Z and then put it in the function and then suddenly like you're healed. I think it's like, it's going to be this, it's a lifelong process. Like still for me, being able to talk about it and present my story in that way, it, it helps with the process. But then I also see, and I'm realizing it's like, oh man, there's so much more work to do. And, and where do you stop? Because I feel like, especially when that kind of trauma leads to a death that's not really resolved, you're gonna spend the rest of your life like figuring it out or trying to make it to get it to a place where it doesn't hurt so much. Um, and maybe I don't know if that's healed or healing in that way. Or maybe you're slowly healing, but I don't feel like I'm ever getting to like that space of total like release. And maybe that's the tension that I have to fight with for the rest of my life. And that's why that's what I do, like to create this way. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, thank you. Uh, <laughs>